So let's say we have a timeline in Unreal Engine and we have a track on that. And now we want to dynamically set the values of the track, a number of keys to set to a certain time and a certain value uh, based on some gameplay stuff. That can be quite tricky, actually, because the timeline itself uh, doesn't have any inputs for any such thing. Now, uh, when you add a timeline, it adds a component variable and you can use that to uh, set a certain curve to a certain track with a certain name, but then we need to make an asset for that. So now we're stuck with having to make a bunch of pre-made assets that we can swap around with, which still isn't ideal. But it's entirely possible to make and change a dynamically created curve asset and use that to set your float curve with. The only issue is that for most of this to work, we're going to need to dabble into a little bit of C++. Nothing too complex, nothing too major, but some of the functions we need are simply just not accessible within Blueprint. So what we're going to do is I'm going to come here into the C++ classes and I'm going to make a new C++ class. And we're going to go into all classes and then we're going to look for the float curve. You can, of course, also do this with a vector curve or a color curve or whatever you just need to make separate classes for all of those we're just going to do the float curve for right now today so uh, once we decide we make that we can call this uh, something like dynamic float curve give it a good name and just put that anywhere where you want you're going to put it in the public folder and then we create that class once that is done we'll have a h file and a cpp file and I'm using a writer here, by the way, as my ID. If you want to use it as well, there's a link down below in the description, which will get you three months of a free trial rather than, I don't know, the usual, I think, one month that you get. Anyway, here we can add new variables and new functions uh, to work with. So we're going to create a new U function, which will be blueprint callable. We can get category dynamic curve. That's just what GitHub Copilot is suggesting. Uh, this is going to be a void. So it's not going to be returning anything. Uh, set curve values uh, is indeed what we're going to do. So set curve values. And then GitHub Copilot suggests something that I personally don't love. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just take in a T array of type, uh, not float. We're going to be doing F vector 2D at uh, new values. This technically uh, can be const if you want it to be, which is just a slight bit more performance, uh, but we're not going to complicate anything like that today. Uh, once we declare it in the H file, uh, we can we can quite simply uh, generate a definition in the corresponding CPP file, which is right over here. I have them side by side. And what this is going to do is because this is a child of the U float curve as it is, it has all the functionality of a U float curve. And in C++, that includes setting new values or updating existing values on a curve. So what we can do is we can just simply for loop. So for each f vector 2d uh, let's call that key in the new values and in that we can simply get our uh, float curve so if we just look for a float curve like that we can add key or add an update key it doesn't really matter in this case and we're just going to take in our uh, key dot x and our key y as the values and that will then input those at the time and the value for each entry in the array that we're given in. Uh, before the for loop, it might also be good to get our float curve and then adjust, get the keys array on that and empty it. So when we set our new values, we're going to get rid of all the old values first, and then we're just going to set all the new values like this. Now, there's one little issue, and that is if we construct this object now, uh, it's going to not have all this, and we're going to need to explicitly call the set curve values, which is possible, but annoying. So if that's all you want to do, uh, at this point, it would be possible to just uh, go into your blueprint and construct object from class, uh, take our dynamic float curve, create that, and then uh, I don't think we have compiled it yet, so... The function doesn't exist on it yet, but we could call the function that we just made right after this uh, because it is set to being a U function that is blueprint callable. And we also probably want to mark this as public just in case. 
But wouldn't it be nicer to, when we construct this object as well, uh, give in its initial value so that we don't have to bother like doing all that? Well, for that, we can actually uh, make a factory function, uh, as we call that. So we can make a new U function here. So let's do a U function, uh, make that blueprint callable again. Uh, category, we can just call it dynamic curve. That's fine. And this one we're going to make static. And that means that we're not going to need an object to call it on. It's just a function that exists on the class as a whole. So we won't need to pull over any of these like blue pins. It'll just exist as a function in the drop down menu, meaning that we can now make a function within this class to spawn in an object of this class, right? If that doesn't make any sense, it will in a moment, hopefully. And the type that it will be will just be our uh, U dynamic curve uh, pointer. So it's going to be returning a pointer to the thing that it's creating. Where it uh, takes in, let's see what GitHub Copilot has to say. It says create dynamic curve, that's right. It takes in a U object pointer for the outer. That is important when you're instantiating basic U objects. And then a TRA vector 2D for the input keys. That is also correct. So let's do that. Once we've made that, we can simply implement this in the CPP file. And here we first make a, a U dynamic uh, float curve pointer. And we'll set that as a new curve, which is equal to indeed new object of type U dynamic float curve which takes in the outer that we're passing in here as the parameter, and it will be of class U dynamic float curve static class. Copilot is really helpful in uh, writing all that for us. So we're creating a new pointer and creating a new object that we're pointing to, and this is going to be our eventual return value. So let's just put that in immediately. Uh, we're going to be uh, returning the new curve. And this will allow us to create that new curve. But now before we actually do that returning, we're going to get that new curve and we're going to set curve values on it. And we're just going to take in the input keys uh, from this, pass that through. So we'll create a new curve. Then immediately after creating it, we're going to be calling this function on it, which is a function on the object itself. So that's why we need an object instance to call on. We're just going to pass through the input keys to this, which takes in the exact same type of parameter. It's going to run all this, and after that, it's going to return that pointer to that new curve for us to be able to use in Blueprint and like save as a variable and update whenever we want to whatever we want. So after we've done all this, uh, we can compile and go back into Blueprint. I told you it was going to be fairly straightforward and fairly easy to set up the C++ side of this. And the reason we needed the C++ uh, thing is because add key is simply not accessible uh, in Blueprint. And now that we're back in Blueprint, instead of doing this construct dynamic float curve, we have the static function that we can just directly call, called create dynamic curve, which will take in an outer and the input keys, as we just coded up. So we can uh, just as an outer, uh, an outer is a kind of a annoying little thing that you have to uh, take care of with like regular U objects. It's just the object that owns the object that you're creating. So because this is just a generic object, it's going to need to have an owner. So when the owner gets destroyed, it also automatically like destroys uh, the object that we're creating here. So that can just be a reference to self. And then input keys, uh, we can make an array. The X values will be the time of the key and the Y values will be the value of the key in the timeline. So we can set like zero, zero, and then we can set one, uh, like two, and then we can set maybe like five, uh, 15, and so on and so forth. Of course, since we're now doing this through an array, we can do this based on uh, programmatic things, or we can just film out like this. We don't really have much visual feedback uh, for this. You'd need to make like an entire separate editor thing for that, which is a little uh, going overboard, I would say. Uh, but let's create this on begin play and then save this as a variable. So this will be our dynamic curve. And then getting our timeline before we even run this at all. And keep in mind that this timeline track is just zero to zero. We haven't added any keys to this at all, but we can set a, a float curve. And even though we made a child of float curve, uh, we can still just put this in because it's still technically 
count as a float group, even though it has some extra added functionality. And then uh, the track name in this case will be track zero. I'm just going to copy that over to prevent any typos. And then we can play that from the start. Now, the fun thing is we can get this dynamic curve uh, reference that we have here. And he now we can uh, set the curve values, which also takes in an array of vector 2Ds. And we can run this at any point and our timeline will instantly reflect that now. There is one thing uh, to be a little bit uh, cautious about though, and that is if we have uh, a timeline that looks a little uh, something like this as a graph, and we just go from like zero to one. If we are at like roughly this point in the timeline, and we suddenly change our timeline to look like this, what it's actually going to look like for the people playing the game is this will just instantly jump up to there and then continue going it's not going to like nicely interpolate between them if you wanted to do that that would require like quite a bit of extra coding so generally speaking what i would say is wait for the timeline to reach its end right here and only here do your updating code so that way the next time it plays through the timeline it's going to be playing the updated new information so we can just do that with uh, unfinished. We set the timeline curves to whatever we want. So zero, zero will still be the same. Uh, but then after the first go around, uh, what we'll do is maybe we will uh, like split these structure pins. Uh, we'll maybe remove this one. And I don't know, the time will be the current player's velocity or something like get velocity. And from that, we'll just get the vector length that will be the value that we're counting up to and then the time at which we put that will maybe be just five seconds or something like that you can also drive this programmatically of course whatever values you want to hook up to this you can hook up to this now on update we're just going to a uh, quickly print string of the value uh, for the floats and again you can you can do this exact same thing with a vector curve as well so that you have three channels uh, to do with as you want but let's just uh, run this for now so we will see we'll create this dynamic curve the timeline itself has nothing going on in it but we're setting that dynamic curve to that flow track so we'll see it counting from zero to two within one second and then over the next four seconds it's going to be counting up to 15 then when the timeline finishes it's going to uh, set the curve to count from zero to however fast we were moving within the next five seconds. Uh, and after that, it is, of course, also important to uh, get a reference to the timeline and play from start. So we'll see one, two, three, four, and suddenly it's counting a lot faster. And then now it is counting up super fast. And when I stand still, you'll be able to see now it's just staying at zero because it takes my velocity at the moment where it loops around to the end so if i just inch forward a little bit maybe we can get a very slow movement there we go so you can see it's now counting up to a slightly less high number because i wasn't moving as quickly so we can now drive timeline both the time of each key and the value of each key entirely by gameplay data if we want to which unlocks a whole bunch of interesting things that you can do so it's pretty easy to set up but if you do want the project files just to look around or just to copy the code over to your own project or whatever there's a link down below in the description to the patreon page uh, to download it all for youtube members and it also helps out supporting the channel to make more fun little videos like this so next time i don't know what we'll be doing but certainly it'll be something fun i'll see you all back when we get there and a very big thank you to all of my patrons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. A huge thank you to my Cave Student tier supporters, Earl Monsoval Erno, and my Cave Digger tier supporters, Sergey Thomas, 